You see, uh, thinking that I have to deliver a, speak, a speech in English, um, thought maybe there is someone preparing something for YouTube. <laughs> so um, this is really a challenge today for me. Uh, because I, yeah, about two days ago, I've seen Mr. Oettinger, Minister President from uh, Baden-Württemberg, trying to become an EU commissioner. And I've seen him telling, always, uh, always telling her, uh, uh, English is the working language all over the globe. And then I saw him delivering his speech. So I hope I do a bit better. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. One of the topics you discuss is moving beyond Copenhagen. I think this is a very important point. Why? Because it's not asking that we look uh, and focusing on the point looking to Bonn. It's not focusing on the idea looking to Mexico City. It's just beyond Copenhagen. And the question, what should we do? It's not waiting for another international meeting uh, where we uh, see you know, two chiefs one from the United States, one from China, looking at each other, not finding any solution. So we don't wait for this. We ask ourselves, what do we think we should do or are obliged to do beyond Copenhagen? Your Congress is very output-orientated. I like this. And one of the aims you have listed in your program is to produce clear policy recommendation to decision-makers. This is really... A goal. I shall therefore present to you a strategy or introduce a bit of strategy with which we intend to bring together international economics and climate change because we think international economics, climate change, ecology, this all belongs together. What strategy am I referring to? Let me have a look at our problems. The world is currency, uh, currently experiencing many crises, the financial crisis, the economic crisis, the climate crisis, and the food crisis. Tackling these will be challenging and will require priorities to be set. In Germany, what have we done in Germany? In Germany, we have, uh, the banks have been stabilized. There is a fund to provide loans to business. Whilst, whilst the solar industry and measures to improve energy efficiency of buildings, for example, are currently not seen as a matter of priority. I compare these two. Indeed, the government would also like to make cuts to the development assistance budget. The sum of 400 million euros pledged by the German government in Copenhagen to help poorer countries seems modest if I look at the banks and bank saving funds. They are really modest if you compare it with, for example, the new 1 billion euro tax break. This government has done one, 1 billion euro tax break per year to be granted to hotel, hotels alone. If you look at the no newspapers, hotel prices are still growing. So it does not make any sense. But are these priorities you know, that is a question, what kind of priorities we have to fix? Personally, I think we have to look at these crises, these several crises we have, and we have to understand that they all belong together, that they all have the same roots. It's not only, it's not only a cause or root for this crisis, financial, another root, for the climate crisis, no, that would be wrong. It's all a result of short-sighted, unregulated, and globalized style of economics dominated by the financial sectors. And these crises reinforce each other. Let us have a look at the Stern report from 2006. This report is very interesting in our context. The report makes clear that climate measures may cost a lot of money but that the costs of doing nothing to protect the climate are far higher. And this is common for all the crises we are talking about. This is why, am I, why I am calling for a strategy of tackling the different global crises together, rather than playing them off 
against each other. This means dealing with the causes responsible for all the crisis. Achieving this will require deeds rather than just words. To this end, we are, I am proposing a Green New Deal. What is a Green New Deal? The idea behind a Green New Deal is that it would put an end to styles of living, to styles of economics, to budgeting, which are at the expense of others and at the expense of the climate. We must now take decisions for the long term with an awareness of the future impact of decisions taken today. Normally, people look at, you know, if you are focusing on, on taxes and hotels, they just look for the next day. What are hotel prices or taxes in Austria? What are hotel prices and taxes in Bavaria? And then they find a sol one billion euro solution. And on the next day, you read in your newspapers, hotel prices are still increasing. No, I'm looking for a long-term decision, for really seeing the future impacts of any decision you take. Actions must be avoided which, with, uh, which merely achieve short-term benefits for a few, yet in the long term mean disadvantages for everybody, or almost everybody. To this end, we need rules, instruments, and effective monitoring. What does this mean? It means that we must set completely different priorities in policy making. We, we need an end to economics at the expense of climate protection, an end to more growth, whatever it costs, an end to low uh, and going to low carbon economics, and we need an end to the link between growth and the use of resources. I think this is the point we should focus on. We can use market instruments like competition and regulation to accelerate progress towards a low carbon society. One of the examples frequently given in this context is emission trading. Other examples include setting goals to be achieved within a certain time frame, such as ceilings for average CO2 emissions for cars, for example, or for buildings. Or another idea is the top runner approach, whereby the most energy efficient appliance in a category is used as a binding benchmark. In the period from the end of the 1990s to 2005, Japan used this top runner approach and what did they manage? They, to give you just one example of a lot, the Japan managed to reduce the electricity consumption of its computers by 90% using this top runner approach. You see, the most effective computer in a category sets the standard. After, for example, two years, you are only allowed to bring new computers to the market, the new ones, which really hit this target. You are not allowed to use more electricity, for example. And see, in about 15 years, they pushed so much for innovation that they reduced the electricity consumptions by more than 90%. There are a lot of ideas, a lot of tools one could use really to set benchmark time frames, really to get something like a circle of innovation by this. And just saying grows only, we don't live on the coast of people somewhere else on the world or where you don't live on the coast of future generations. What we need is for a new concept of development, rules. We need rules of this kind that drive competition for innovation. <laughs> and we need these rules on two levels, national and international level, to organize a cycle, a cycle of competition. Both at national and international level, I said, in order to make possible these innovations, support is needed primarily for research in this field. Research should not be, in future, should not be something you set aside. Okay, at the end, we, a little percentage we use for research. You really want to push 
an innovation circle. You have to organize competition and have you, you have to implement a lot of money for research. You see the Mittelstand, the little enterprises will never be able to raise such a lot of money to put into research creative ideas, but there is a crea creative class in our society. And the middle stand, the medium side, the, the family-driven enterprises, these are the ones that had the best creative ideas. This is not the big international industry, so they need money, and the state should give them money for research because it's in our own egocentric interest for the future, and not only for tomorrow. So. To make possible innovation, support is needed for research. Even transitional and digressive uh, support. Don't think that we want to uh, you know, set new, a new agenda about increasing support. No, we want to give support for research, support for market implementation. And OK, we push them in the market. We're surrounding them with uh, new rules. And then the support should be, the subsidies should be de degressive, of course. We need, for example, uh, degressive support like we have with the feed-in tariffs for renewable energies, introduced in Germany by the Renewable Energy Sources Act. Or we need start-up financing for the sale of electric uh, cars in a way like the uh, United States started, started to do it. We need measures to improve the energy efficiency of buildings. They, for example, have a huge potential for reducing carbon. Let us have a look at, on this. One third of overall energy and two thirds of CO2 emissions in Germany result from heating of buildings. One third of the energy and two thirds of the emissions in Germany. So if you focus on new programs, on special subsidies of helping them with research, you, when you try to you know, modernize houses, you really are on the right point. Simply in the increasing the funding available to improve the energy efficiency of buildings could allow the goal of cutting CO2 emissions by 40% in the next 10 years. 40%. Additionally, it would create jobs in small businesses, in the skilled trades and even in the chemical industry because they are producing the building materials. It is therefore sensible to invest in this area and indeed to increase investments rather than cutting financing as the German federal government is doing in these days. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that Germany ha German's economy has a strong industrial bone. And I'm focusing on this because I, I don't want you thinking, you know, the Greens are just looking at the middle stand, at new little enterprises, family driven or so. No, we very well know our strong industrial bone, which is focused on the traditional car, steel, engineering, and chemical industry. And the very important point is that if we want to make, as we call a Green New Deal, a different way of financing subsidizing a different way of producing, not on the costs of others and other generations, then we focus especially on this. We focus on our industrial backbone. And to say it with other words, blue colors must be replaced by green colors. If we want to organize a change, we have to look at the blue color jobs. Of course, I know no one has a blue color, for example, at BMW or at Mercedes or VW. No, no, no. They are, you know, differently clothed. But you all understand the word blue color job. So we have to go in the industry to the blue color jobs. Maybe we could also say we need something like a blue green alliance. In Germany, everyone is now talking about coalitions. Who could do a coalition with whom? For which government ever? Federal, North Rhine-Westphalia, whatever. But that is not. The, very, the most interesting question. The most interesting question is if we want to go for change, for really a new concept of development, then we need a different thing than coalition of parties. We need a blue-green alliance. The blue-color job must be in future a green-color job. 
The car industry, for example, needs to restructure and to think outside the box. You know, the mobility of the future will be different to the mobility of today. How can we reach minus 90% CO2 until 2050 in Germany? I could say, let's go out, stop 10 cars, and then we all decide which one is the one to be allowed to drive. And the other nines we kick off. But this shouldn't be our result. We are creative enough to, to develop a different way of mobility, and that's what we should do. Electric cars, everyone is talking about, is, are one element of this, but only one element. We need more. We na need the creative class to develop integrated concepts for mobility, for cities, for rural areas, integrated concepts. It's not only a question about technologies for metros, for S-Bahn, for buses, for cars, individual cars. It's also a question of the software to put them together, to buy one ticket to, to go from here, for example, by bus to the train station, to the airport, to another train station, doing car sharing, using buses, all with one ticket, and all in a, you know, precisely planned, except these days where we have too much snow, of course. So what we need is really to think outside the box, Think a really different system and not in the old. It's not only a question of automotive or electric car or hybrid cars. It's a question of a really integrated concept for mobility where you are allowed to develop the car totally new or the system totally new. Those who get involved in these technologies and softwares today will be at the forefront tomorrow. While the other companies that miss the boat will have the problems and will lose the jobs in their regions. Or let us have a look at the chemical industry. You know, this they have just uh, st and still a great deal of unexploited potential to making its production processes more en energy efficient and less resource intensive. You know, in Germany, more than 20% of the production of the chemical industry is closed down. The answer for the 20% of blue-collar workers or engineers that are kicked off, the answer is not produce more for a high-intensive agriculture, for example. The answer is not produce more for more pollution, pollution in the soil, the water, the sea. No, the answer is think outside the box. If you do, as I already mentioned, if you, we, you implement rules for, for buildings, how much is heating or electricity is a building in future times allowed to use? Then you have the push. It's good for the people that live there because reduce they reduce their costs, costs. It's good for the handwerkers, for uh, the special trade, and it's also good for chemical industry because they now produce not fossil-based uh, products, uh, fertilizers or herbicides for, the, for agriculture, they produce the material you need to modernize the houses and the flats. This can be the answer for these 20% that are kicked off in this situation. So there are a lot of chances in a transition period even for the chemical industry. Going from an oil-based synthetic chemical industry to uh, a production based on renewable resources and efficiency. What I need is, wh what I want is on this point, not only promote a for a new part of German industry. I'm not discussing here we build the ma machines, here we have uh, chemical industry, car industry, and then the next big one is renewable or efficiency. No, what I'm focusing on is to change these industry. Think outside the box, as means change machine producing, chemical industry, change car industry, change the way we produce. We want to place the whole economy on an ecological footing. This sounds like a huge project, project but we will never achieve the two degree goal if we approach things in something like a half-hearted fashion. And the longer we hesitate before taking action, the more it will cost, as 
already explained by the Stern report. That is why I said, I don't want to wait for Bonn, I don't want to wait for Mexico City. Let's just go on. And maybe we all could be a big, important group helping Obama. You see, Obama has a lot of problems getting uh, his, uh, okay, even more than a lot. Okay, how, how is he able to get the majorities for the health care reform? Oh, there is a face saying, no, he will not. Oh, maybe, maybe the, you know, it's a health care, decreasing health care reform, but there will be a bill with the title health care reform. And then he goes on to the next challenges. Will he be able to push the American Congress to do more than he offered in Copenhagen? Or will he even get a majority for what he offered in Copenhagen, the 17% in the US Congress? We can give him a hand. And the hand is not criticizing him. The hand is going on by changing industry, going on with ecological modernization in Europe and in Germany. Because then he is in the Congress saying, we are losing jobs because they are moving so fast. This is a very intelligent way of giving someone a hand. Not to push it just by going onward and being the front of all this. So don't let us hesitate. Think of supporting Obama because he is very important, getting the push so that we don't end in the same situation. China, United States, no one is moving both sides should see there is Europe going on and using all the possibilities for jobs, for development, for being the most creative, having the best machines, the most efficient ways, and so on. Something like, a, you could say, a pioneering role in climate protection. I fear that in the situation now with Angela Merkel, we are losing this leadership because she'd sometimes tell, okay, Germany should reduce 40% of the CO2 emissions by 2020. She says it, but she, the CDU never votes yes in Parliament for this. And in every challenge, in every question, you see that they don't never, you know, walk the talk. They never implement the measures you need to, you know, finish minus 40% emissions in 2020. So let us be and be the ones that have the pioneering rule and let us head the start in the climate protection industry. So I have two words, uh, the climate protection industry over all industries made by a blue-green alliance. It will take more than just ecological restructuring of the economy. If if you want to shape lifestyles, economics, and budgeting to a more humane and climate-friendly fashion, we really have to learn to think different and to learn to live differently. This is vital for us to make really a change. We need to think about, and we also need to think about prosperity. What is prosperity? Because we can only do the change if we deal with this world and ask ourselves, what is it, prosperity? What, what should that mean for us? Prosperity cannot be what it is measured in the moment because now it is measured in calculating per capita GDP. Why do I say no to the GDP as we have it now? I say n no because this does not measure quality. It does not measure future. It's just for the next morning, for the feeling of some people. You see, there are a lot of factors that are not in. We have accidents, illnesses, natural, natural disasters, depletion of resources. What is about a clean environment, good health, social cohesion? That should also be a part of the de definition of prosperity. Can you imagine to have a look at Germany in some years, the city of Berlin will have about 50% of six-year-old children. This is the age where you come to school. 50% of the six-year-old children will be with migration background. 
Not all of them are well educated. A lot of them come from very poor families, not educational orientated. Can you imagine all half of our children coming to school with six years not being able to speak German, even not being able to speak a proper Arabic or Turkish language? You can imagine what does that mean for their development? What does that mean for inclusion or exclusion in society? What does all that mean later on for social cohesion? So how can we say our wealth, our prosperity is just the calculating the per capita GDP? This is wrong. We have to change it. Prosperity should be something different. Let us implement the environment, good soils you also can use next year or the next 10 years, which give rural areas or the question of how do we feed the world an answer, not having too much fertilizers in it, for example. A lot of points we have to put in in our idea about uh, prosperity. Today, today, prosperity and GDP are generally, generally seen as one and the same thing. The higher the GDP is, the higher prosperity is, people think. I think this is wrong, really wrong. So let us go on a new way with this. Let us bring in a new order in defining GDP. If we don't reach this, we'll really have a problem. And I focus on German government on this. Our German government has a special answer to our problems in the moment. They say if we have uh, a strong GDP growth, we'll solve our problems. You know, we have um, a lot of financial and budget problems in Germany. You have read about this. The answer is more growth. You know, Germany is already on a high level. If, you know, we say for all the red, uh, the depth we have in German budget, we would need about 9% growth. Can you imagine Germany having 9% growth? That is totally nonsense on our high level. You can imagine 9% growth for one of the least developed countries, but not for Germany. What would that mean? That would mean that China should have 25 or what? or least developed countries should have uh, 50 or what. This is nonsense. And we'll never have 9% growth. Only if we have the growth that brought us to the crisis. You know, living on the coast, on resources, destroying our soil, having more uh, carbon uh, around us, more CO2 emissions. So that's, this is a nonsense way. So this is our problem we have in Germany. Just the rise of the GDP is in our government's heads. Should this fail, and I think this will fail, the prospect, pro, prospects are really bleak. The government has no plan B. So I think we should focus on a different strategy. The sh first step should be redefine prosperity and growth, measure them differently. This is, I know, not an new idea, already the EU and the uh, OECD are discussing about this. Alternative ways of measuring growth and prosperity. Sarkozy, sometimes he's very fast, has even established uh, a high-level commission. I think uh, chief of this commission is Stieglitz, and he already write, wrote his paper. This is not a question of abolishing GDP, but GDP should no longer be seen as the one all-important indicator for our, our future or the one and important guide to all economic thinking worldwide. So ecological factors such as CO2 emissions, consumption of resources, use of land, together with social factors, wealth distribution, health, education, they all must be part of a new system of calculation. My, maybe this will be something like having a boosting effect on the educational sector. This is what I want because of social cohesion, because of you know, getting more people in the creative class, having all the new ideas. You see, the existence of this new indicator is also not sufficient. It needs to be actually be applied and to be published together with the GDP 
At the beginning of 2009, the Green Parliamentary Group in the Bundestag tabled a motion on the subject of including environmental reporting in the report of the leading German economic research institutes and the report by the German Council of Economic Experts. Of course, this motion was rejected by the majority of parliament, but you can be sure we'll do it again until we reached our goals. We want to develop a new definition of growth, the unthinking, unsophisticated, purely quantitative definition of growth must be replaced by quality of growth. Not expense, not at the expense of the population and the climate, and not leading to an increasing consumption of resources. Ladies and gentlemen, to give you some examples, what would, be, would have been different in the financial crisis and economic crisis this world has seen? This would, for example, mean for Germany investing the money not in the scrappage of cars, but in low emission cars or electronic electromobility mobility. No, I'm in mobility systems. And this, I think, would set motion, a motion in process, a long-term impact for climate, for the labor market, and even more competition on the international market. I would, would say what we need is, like I tried to explain now, a Green New Deal. Quality and growth. This is not only a new deal to solve short-term problems. This really means a Green New Deal, where we change various things in our life, where we do not only replace traditional German industry with here and there some green sectors, where we really change the traditional industry. We know that our social security systems, for example, need this change. They need the change where we see what is not allowed to grow, what should grow, and come into a move so that we have, for example, tax income we can use, you know, for building up or keeping our social security, for example. The current crisis have demonstrated very, very dramatically that we cannot go on with this. The current crises have shown us that there is an end of the old definition of good life. This old good life wa was for the rich white man in the north. If I say man, I also mean woman, of course. This was the way of life for the rich white man in the north on the coasts of the south. I'm sure that in e all levels, if it is Bonn, Copenhagen, or if it's again world, the world trade negotiations, for example, Geneva, the the, the least developed countries, Brazil, China, India, Japan, they will not allow us to go on the old way. You never get a decision on this international negotiating circus, whatever you are dealing with, if we don't change our way of life, our way of producing. Because it always needs only one country saying no. And then you never get a result. So the point would be, let us go on so that we ha could have in future nego negotiations that come to an end. And as I said, let us go on with, the, with change, with the Green New Deal for our own egoistic interest. Let us go on to help, for example, Obama, which is not unimportant to have a change internationally. He has more power than, for example, an African country has. We as a Green will try to implement motion by motion in the Parliament. We try to do the, uh, the discussion in public. That's why I'm here. And for this new con concept of development, we also try to get an enquete commission in the German Bundestag. This is my last point, because we all have to discuss the details of such a Green New Deal, a Green New concept where we put blue and green together. You know, what would an ecologically acceptable economic system 
would look like? How do we want to deal with our traditional industry? How do we ensure social security and social cohesion in an aging, shrinking society? How can we achieve the transition to a knowledge society? This all, these questions all, are why we are calling a so-called study commission on the topic of growth at the Bundestag. This uh, study commission will examine these questions in detail with external academic support and impact from us. So I hope I gave you, s and you understood them, some ideas of, of how the change should be made. The most important is it's not only a, a pot of green color to old industries and old ways, it's really a different way of producing where you always ask, am I producing on the coast of un others? What is about the soil after I produced on it? Renewable energies, food, whatever. What is about the water of after my production process? What is about the air and the climate after my my production process. So let us think everything really new. Normally, we are creative enough to find a totally different way. Let us go on doing a Green New Deal. And I want to make one thing sure. We need a huge toolbox with a lot of different tools. There is rules from the state, voluntary changes, and at the very end, consumers. But the consumers are at the very end. Not everyone should go five years to a university to see what is inside the product. What is the process? Is that low, a low carbon process? Is that fairly paid? Is that ecological? No. You know, we should do it like as if we are all disabled persons. You know, there should no be any barriers in this society for good behavior. There you say, you should, with your wheelchair, you should be able to enter everywhere. And I say, if I go to a shop and buy something, if it's a car, clothes, food, I should immediately see what it is, how it is produced. So that is very easy for me and you to change the life in everything we do 24 hours a day. But this is not at first a question of the consumers. It's at first a question of industry and politics to change their products so that they are differently produced and that every consumer sees at the first, at the first uh, view this is different, I buy, buy this and not the old one. Thank you.